As we leave the wreckage of the meta that was the end of 2008's metagame, changes were on the horizon. We had just entered the 5D's era proper, and since its start, Teledad was an uncontrollable beast, taking over every event's top cut and threatening to do the same going into 2009 with no shot at a ban list until March unless an emergency one would drop. In addition to this, a lawsuit was raging on in the background, as Konami vs Upper Deck had come to a head with Konami refusing to provide product to Upper Deck for distribution, with Upper Deck issuing a statement saying that the newest set of champion packs, the packs used as entry compensation and prizing at LCS tournaments, was not provided to them for distribution, to which Konami issued a statement claiming that it was due to Konami terminating the contract between the two companies, even though the issue was still being debated in court. Because of this, there was no beginning of the year set release that would usually kick off the year, meaning we're going to be jumping straight into the SJC circuit. SJCs this particular year are also going to be a bit of a sticky situation, as the Shonen Jump Championships were mostly an upper deck creation, meaning that with the constant fluctuation from Konami v Upper Deck, SJCs were going to slow off tremendously this year compared to the previous years, resulting in only 7 SJCs in the entirety of 2009, two of which would happen before the lawsuit would be settled. SJC San Francisco would take place on January 10th, and surprising no one, Teledad's Tier 0 reign was still in full swing, taking 12 of the top 16, with the remaining top spots going to decks we've seen previously. Alejandro Reyes would win the day on Teledad, seeing a fairly standard lineup to those we've seen recently with more emphasis placed on discard tools like Snipe Hunter and Phoenix Wing Wind Blast. SJC Houston would follow a week later on January 17th, and we'd see yet another dominating performance from Teledad, taking 14 of the top 16 as well as first place piloted by Jerry Wang, claiming his third SJC title with his list dropping some of the discard tools in favor of Special Summon Negation with cards like Royal Oppression and Solemn Judgment. We would also see a new set of Shonen Jump promos hit mailboxes around this time, and both were powerful in very different ways. The first of these was Dandelion, who special summoned two level 1 fluff tokens when sent to Grave. While the card had already been preemptively limited, Dandelion would make some decks playing plant options like Lone Fire more consistent, although its true power would come later in the era due to its synergy with two plant tuners that had not yet been released. The second was a new dragon boss monster and Red Eyes Darkness Metal Dragon, a level 10 boss that could be special summoned by banishing a dragon on field and could special summon a dragon from Grave once per turn. While Red Med was notably powerful, he was inconsistent to set up at this time, as its most consistent enabler, Red Eyes Wyvern, was exclusive to the EU at this time thanks to its inclusion in the Tag Force 3 bundle overseas. Because of this, Wyvern was not legal to play in US tournaments, along with its sister promo Gallus the Star Beast, until it received some form of US reprint. With that established, set releases were about to begin rolling again, as in mid-February, a decision was reached in the California court system, ordering Upper Deck to, effective immediately, stop all association with Konami's trademark property and disassociate itself from the Yu-Gi-Oh! trading card game, returning all control of the game and its surrounding environment back into the hands of Konami. Because of this shift, all SJCs in 2009 were placed on a temporary hold as control of the game shifted back to Konami meaning we won't be seeing any further tournament results until around April, when the tournament scene would slowly start back up again. Duelist Pack Yusei Release Date February 24th, 2009 Set Type Duelist Pack Major Strategies Synchron Warrior Impact A couple of new Synchro Toolbox tools Duelist Pack Yusei, being the first set to emerge from the release purgatory, brought next to nothing new for the game, but it did bring two specific cards that would see play. The first of these was Tuning Wear, being a level 1 machine that could be considered level 2 for a synchro summon and drew the user a card when it was used as synchro material. Tuning Wear would specifically see experimentation alongside machine duplication, similarly to how Card Trooper was used previously, as it, with practically any tuner, allowed access to almost any generic synchro in the current pool using this combination, drawing heavily when you did. The other card was Armory Arm, a level 4 synchro that could be equipped to a monster, boost its attack by 1000, and deal damage to the opponent any time the equipped monster destroyed another monster in battle equal to the attack of the destroyed monster. Armory Arm would be a staple of extra decks as the only level 4 generic synchro for the time, but also because of an OTK it could pull off in certain circumstances with Colossal Fighter. 
In a case where the opponent has a monster on field with 1900 or more attack, you could make both Armory Arm and Colossal Fighter, equip Armory Arm to the opponent's monster, and repeatedly slam Colossal Fighter into it, burning the opponent for 28 and reviving the Colossal Fighter each time you did. This OTK came up rarely at the time, but it was something that did come up on occasion, cementing Armory Arm and Colossal Fighter as staple pieces of the extra deck for a good time after. This release was followed by the March 1st ban list, and this list had a single goal in mind, knee cap Teledad as hard as it is necessary to end the tier 0 meta. Newly limited were Chaos Sorcerer, up from 0, Dad, down from 2, Gladiator Beast Bestiari, down from 3, Goyo Guardian, down from 3, Mizuki, down from 3, Plague Spreader Zombie, down from 3, Card of Safe Return, down from 2, Emergency Teleport, down from 3, and Rhoda, down from 3. Newly semi-limited were Destiny Hero Malicious, down from 3, Goblin Zombie, down from 3, Green Baboon, up from 1, Ryza, up from 1, Summoner Monk, a preemptive hit to an upcoming release, Allure of Darkness, down from 3, Destiny Draw, down from 3, Gold Sarcophagus, up from 1, Mind Crush, up from 1, and Ultimate Offering, up from 1. Lastly, Unlimited here were Manticore of Darkness from 2, Phantom of Chaos from 2, Twin-Headed Behemoth from 1, Book of Moon from 2, and Nobleman of Crossout from 2. This list did a ton to hurt both Teledad and the competition that would have risen up around it, with Dad, Goyo, Plague Spreader, e Telly, Rhoda, Malicious, Allure, and Destiny Draw all being hits to the deck pure, and Mizuki, Card of Safe Return, and Goblin Zombie being hit to the deck's zombie variant as well as other zombie decks that would have risen from Dad's fall. In addition to this, Bestiari taking a hit here was entirely thanks to the meta prior to Teledad, as with Teledad gone, there would be a strong chance that Gladiator Beast would just take over again. This set the baseline for the meta moving into the first core set release of the year, and almost every player was ready for it to bring something new to shake up the increasingly stale metagame. Crimson Crisis Release date, March 3rd, 2009. Set type, Core Set. Major Strategies, Assault Mode, Blackwing, Reactor. Impact, The Birth of an Icon. Crimson Crisis would end the drought far more effectively than Duelist Pack you say before it, as it was a follow-up to a massive ban list that upended the Tier 0 meta and brought a ton of new tools for both new strategies and older meta presences. Its highlight strategy, though, would not be an effective one, being the Assault Mode series. This series of monsters, being souped up versions of synchros, would reside in the main deck until you activated Assault Mode Activate while the corresponding synchro was on field, tributing the synchro to allow you to summon the Assault Mode variant directly from deck. If this sounds clunky, that's because it is. Even with tools like Assault Beast to get Activate easier, the entire mechanic was rough because if you drew the Assault Mode variant, it couldn't be summoned and was simply a dead card. Even with tools to offset this like Assault Teleport, as those would be dead if you didn't brick on the bricks in your deck, meaning you've just added more bricks. As for the Assault modes themselves, the only one of note here was Red Dragon Archfiend, as he nuked all other monsters when he attacked, but this wasn't even enough to let the strategy see play. No. The true meta strategy that would come from this instead was Black Wings, a series of winged beasts that focused on swarming the board to make synchro pushes. With its initial wave, we received three main deck monsters and one synchro, being Sirocco, a 2000 attack level 5 that can be normaled for no tribute if your opponent controls a monster and you don't, able to combine the attacks of all black wings onto a single monster for a turn, Bora, who can be special summoned if you control a black wing and pierces, Gale, a level 3 tuner with the same swarm condition and can cut an opponent's monster stats in half once per turn, and Armor Master, a level 7 synchro that can't be destroyed in battle, takes no battle damage, places counters on anything it attacks and doesn't kill, and can remove all of its counters from the board to drop an affected monster's attack and defense to zero that turn. Without a doubt, Blackwing showed the most potential moving forward from this release, as while it wasn't enough now to make it a meta mainstay threat, it was potent enough to be mixed in with some already powerful dark decks and gave decks easy access to level 7 synchros, which became far more important with another release from the set. Frogs received another wave of support here in Dupe, who blocked attacking any monster other than itself, which could be paired with a second to lock all attacking, Flip Flop Frog, who bounced monsters up to the number of face-up frogs on flip, able to flip itself back down, and Submarine, 
a TCG exclusive who dealt piercing damage. Of these, Duke would see some experimentation thanks to Treeborn and Substitute, especially since Substitute and any other monster by itself could form a dupe lock as it became known. Another new archetype here was the Reactor Monsters, a series of monsters that burned the opponent for 800 once per turn when they activated the corresponding card type. Being monsters for Summon Reactor SK, traps for Trap Reactor Wi-Fi, spells for Spell Reactor RE, and any card for Flying Fortress Skyfire. The deck never took off thanks to the simple fact that a once per turn burn effect does not carry the potential to end a game in and of itself, on top of the fact that the monsters were all fairly weak, meaning they were easy to out. However, grouped with this release was also a tuner named Black Salvo, who revived a level 4 Dark Machine on Normal Summon, negating its effects on the field. This was yet another level 7 Synchro Enabler, which primarily was meant to enable the new Synchro Dark Strike Fighter, a level 7 who contribute a monster to burn the opponent for its level times 200, which was, at the time, not once per turn and could be used in main phase 2. This card was, without hyperbole, one of, if not the absolute best, synchro released in the entire 5Ds era, as it enabled any deck that could make a level 7 synchro to OTK the opponent by tributing off your board after the battle phase to unload absurd amounts of damage, which could include itself for an additional 1400. Gladiator Beast received a massive piece of support here in Sam Knight, whose effect absolutely did not matter. What mattered about Sam Knight was the fact that it was a level 3 beast, meaning it was summonable using Rescue Cat, which enabled a combo where you summoned it and Test Tiger with one Rescue Cat, enabling you to immediately tag it out for any Gladiator Beast with their effect. Alien received a wave of support to attempt to make them playable in the 5Ds era here with Ammonite, a level 1 tuner that revived an alien on normal, Overlord, who could special summon itself by removing two A-counters from the field and could place an A-counter on all opponent's monsters once per turn. Golgar, a level 5 synchro that could bounce all face-up spells and traps to place that many A-counters on the board and could remove two A-counters from the board to destroy a card once per turn. Kid, a TCG exclusive that placed an A-counter on any monster special summoned to the opponent's field. Code A Ancient Ruins, a TCG exclusive which generates A counters when an alien is destroyed and can remove two A counters from the field once per turn to revive an alien. Mysterious Triangle, which popped a monster with A counters and summoned an alien from deck. And Planet Pollutant Virus, which tributed an alien to destroy all monsters with A counters on the opponent's field, then placed an A counter on any monster summoned to the opponent's field for three turns. Alien support here was a major revitalization of the strategy, giving the archetype a lot of power in the format, but would move to do absolutely nothing in the meta due to the clunky nature of counters as a mechanic, leading many to not approach the strategy in the first place. Debris Dragon was a level 4 tuner that revived a 500 attack or lower monster on normal summon, but could only make dragon synchros and couldn't be synchroed with a level 4. While Debris at this point would see minimal play, he was worth noting due to providing access to either Iron Chain Dragon or Black Rose Dragon with its own normal summon. Arcanite Magician was a new level 7 synchro option for spellcaster decks, providing both spell counter generation and spot removal, seeing play alongside cards from the next structure deck release. Telekinetic Powerwell provided severe swarming for psychic decks, able to summon any number of level 2 or lower psychics from the grave at the cost of a heavy sum of life points seeing experimentation but very little success in its time. Totem Dragon was a TCG exclusive that provided two tributes for Dragon Monster tribute summons, able to revive itself if the only monsters in Grave are dragons, banishing itself when it leaves the field after being summoned this way. Lastly, OCG imports brought us niche cards to experiment with like Tethys, Adio, and Zeta Reticulant. In addition to the core set release, there were a couple of promos released at this point too, starting with the Shonen Jump promo for March, being Chimera Tech Fortress Dragon, able to be contact fused using Cyber Dragon and any number of other machines from either field, turning Cyber Dragon into the ultimate side deck tool against any machine deck, as you could now special summon it and wipe the board before even beginning your main play line. Lastly, the Duels Pack Collection 10s released on March 10th, and they would bring arguably the only good Assault Mode monster, being Stardust Dragon Assault Mode, who contribute itself to negate anything, reviving itself at the end of the turn. This particular Assault Mode monster would spark some experimentation with the strategy thanks to an Omni Negate being worth intensive investment at the time, but it would still fail to see any major success. This period of time would feel like a lot changed, but with nothing to show for it, as the SJC circuit was still on hold following the lawsuit settlement, meaning that no events would take place between Crimson Crisis's release and the release of the next new structure deck a few weeks later.
Spellcaster's Command. Release date, March 31st, 2009. Set type, Structure Deck. Major Strategies, Spellcasters. Impact, a new staple combo enabler. Spellcaster's Command was an interesting release at the time due to its reliance on spell counter generation, a mechanic that was consistently seeing support trickled out for it, but was seeing little to no success in the competitive space due to the clunky nature of counters. New cards that the deck brought included Endymion, the Master Magician, Disenchanter, Defender, the Magical Knight, Magical Citadel of Endymion, Spellpower Grasp, and easily the best new card from this release, Summoner Monk. Monk allowed the user to discard a spell once per turn to special summon a level 4 monster from deck, which would instantly see experimentation in various strategies thanks to the ability to spam out level 4 monsters like Armageddon Knight, Dark Greffer, or Rescue Cat, which allowed you to push advantage further. As for reprints, this structure deck brought Crystal Seer, Econ, Apprentice Magician, Breaker the Magical Warrior, Book of Moon, and Giant Trunade, showing not the best reprint selection, but also not the worst, hitting some necessary cards like Breaker with its constantly fluctuating banlist status. This wouldn't be the only set bringing reprints for this cycle, as just under a month later, we'd see a revision of one of the better ideas from the previous year's set releases. Gold Series 2009. Release date, April 21st, 2009. Set type, Reprint Set. Major Strategies, The Meta Threats of 2008. Impact, A Severe Lowering of the Price Floor. Gold Series 2009 was attempt number two at the Gold Series formula, and in all fairness, this time it was a really effective swing. Practically every strategy that had cropped up near the end of the GX era had some form of significant reprint here, including cards for strategies that were still the top of the meta. And more importantly, while there were some short printings in the set, it was nowhere near as severe as the previous year's Gold series, coming out to a negligible difference in pull ratios. Reprints here included Sangan, all six of the Monarchs, Treeborn Frog, Snipe Hunter, Six Samurai Staples, the Volcanic Engine, Necro Gardna, Elemental Heroes Captain Gold and Neos Alias, Test Tiger, Dad, Prime Material Dragon, Giant Trunade, Mind Control, Future Fusion, Solemn Judgment, Bottomless, Compulse, Phoenix Wing, and Gold Sarcophagus, which was its first reprint from its time as the SJC prize card. This did tremendous work for the secondary market of the game, bringing down the price of many decks in the meta, but reprints were the only change here. The May 2009 issue of Shonen Jump would bring yet another relevant promo to the field in Beast King Barbaros. A 3000 attack monster that could either be summoned with no tributes to have 1900 attack, or be summoned with three tributes to nuke the opponent's board. While the three tribute effect would almost never come up, the no tribute effect became its shining attribute, as when summoned this way, if you had a way to negate its effects, its attack would reset back up to 3000, giving skill drain beat decks a new threat to play with. This tool was on full display with SJC Anaheim a week later, being the first SJC in a long time that wasn't completely dominated by Teledad, seeing a decent spread of decks to crack the top 16. Going through the top cut, the most represented deck was easily Light Sworn, seeing 7 of the top 16, primarily thanks to its competition's repeated hits on the ban list compared to its singular minor hit of JD to 2. The deck was still a powerhouse, seeing most players opting for cards like Honest and Beckoning Light to push advantage. In a similar vein, there was also a single top from its sister deck in Twilight, which was effectively Light Sworn with an added Dad package to give it a little more firepower, also including Phantom of Chaos to copy either Dad or JDs that were in the graveyard for instant board pressure. Gladiator Beast performed well here with three top spots, integrating Sam Knight for Rescue Cat lines, as well as some players opting for Phantom Dragon to punish early aggression pushes. Blackwing would have its first top cut showing here of many to come, integrating the deck's access to level 7 synchros with Black Salvo and Dekoichi to easily access Dark Strike Fighter on a moment's notice. This was a very common sight in the format, known as Cat Format, to have some way to access Dark Strike Fighter to clean up games, as the power of the ability to tribute off your board to burn the opponent out from a reasonable amount of life points could not be understated. Counter Fairy would also break into the top 16 here thanks mostly to Van Dalken the Dark Dragon Lord, a Shonen Jump promo from 2008 that could summon itself if you negate something with a counter trap, providing an insane amount of power behind your standard Counter Fairy game plan. Teledad had made an adjustment from its previous reckoning of a banned list, now opting for Summoner Monk lines to both access your hero engine with Stratos or to make easy level 8 synchros with Rose, who was a level 4 tuner. 
Drain Beat found revitalization here thanks to Beast King Barbaros, giving the deck easily the most powerful beater option to use under Skill Drain while other decks in the format suffer, adding in Floodgate options like Royal Oppression to back it up further. Lastly, a combination of the previous two strategies could be found in the first place spot for this event, piloted by Jeff Jones for his first major event victory, and this would not be his last. This particular build places a heavier focus on the Destiny Hero package for Dad thanks to Defender being a 2700 defense wall with no downsides under Skill Drain, and Fearmonger's effect being unaffected by the trap. Without question, the format had been shaken up heavily by these releases, and it was about to be broken up further, as the next core set aimed to take many of the themes pushed in the last month to their extremes and even beyond it to form a new meta environment. Raging Battle Release Date, May 12th, 2009 Set Type, Core Set Major Strategies, Blackwings, Morphtronic, Koki Meru. Impact, The Rise of the Birds. Raging Battle, being the second core set of 2009, was expected to expand upon ideas established in Crimson Crisis before it, and in one particular way, it delivered in spades. That way was in further development of Blackwings, who received a major wave of support that would carve out the deck into a meta threat. This wave included Blizzard, a level 2 tuner who revived a level 4 lower Blackwing from Grave on Summon, Shura, who summoned a 1500 or less attack Blackwing from deck when it destroys a monster in battle, Kalut, who could be discarded to boost a Blackwing's attack by 1400 that turn, Elfin, who can be normaled without tributes if you control the Blackwing and swapped an opponent's battle position when normaled, Armedwing, a level 6 synchro with piercing and gains 500 when attacking a defense monster, and the most important of all, Black Whirlwind, which adds a Blackwing from deck to hand with less attack than a Blackwing you normal summon. Between the ability to search swarming synchro pieces, attack modulate in the damage step like how light decks had done the past year, and being able to take advantage of the growing synchro pool better than any other deck, Blackwings were destined for meta success with this wave. On the other side of things, Morphtronic received another wave of support here in Vidion, who gains attack or defense for every equip spell on it, Scopin, a tuner that can either summon a level 4 Morphtronic from hand for synchro summons, or make itself level 4, Power Tool Dragon, the boss monster of the strategy and cover card for the set, who can reveal three equip spells in deck once per turn to add one random one to hand, Double Tool CD, which could only equip to a higher level Morphtronic or Power Tool, giving it a thousand attack and effect negation on your turn and attack redirection on the opponent's turn, and Junk Box, which was a temporary monster reborn for the archetype. The deck was still heavily not meta, but with this support, the previous equip beatdown strategy seemed to solidify as the direction the deck would take moving forward. Although Power Tool Dragon became one of those cards that was an FTK enabler thanks to its very generic search of any equip spell. Earthbound Immortals were a new series of boss monsters that all shared the same ability to attack directly as well as the condition of being destroyed automatically if you controlled no field spell, all of which were considered remarkably bad. Kawaki Meru was a new archetype themed around a series of unusually powerful effects on monsters at the cost of either discarding an iron core of the Kawaki Meru each turn, or by revealing a monster of the same type in hand. While as an archetype this series would flop hard, various pieces from it would find their way into strategies focused around their attributes over time, specifically with Guardian for rocks and Drago for dragons out of this set, as their utility could be applied as long as you had a monster of that type in hand to reveal. Deep Sea Diva was a level 2 tuner that summoned a level 3 or lower Sea Serpent from deck on summon, intended to be used alongside Spined Gilman either as an offensive push of their own or for easy access to Sea Dragon Lord Gishilnadon, who gained attack anytime a level 3 or lower monster is sent to Grave while on field. Dragon Strategies would receive a couple of new tools in Lava Dragon, who acted like a pseudo rescue cat for dragons, requiring one target from hand and one from Grave. Exploder Dragon Wing, who can destroy anything weaker than it that it battles to burn the opponent for that monster's attack, and Trident Dragon, who can destroy up to two of your own cards on summon to gain that many more attacks that turn, none of which would make a significant impact. One for one could send a monster from hand to grave to summon any level one from the deck, which was not too useful in this moment, but would eventually be one of the better synchro enablers in the format. Forbidden Chalice could negate a monster's effect that turn by making it gain 400, allowing use as either effect negation, a battle trick, or in the case of Drain Beat, both. Trap Stun was a new tool that prevented traps from activating that turn, which would see play in decks susceptible to battle traps like Gladiator Beast. Lastly, Snowman Eater was an OCG import that operated similarly to Raikou, popping a monster on field when flipped, 
with the trade-off being it could only pop face-up monsters as opposed to anything, had a stronger defense, and didn't mill when flipped. In the same period, we would also see a couple of video game releases with promos. The first of which was the Wii racing game Wheelie Breakers, which brought the Skull Flame series of cards, none of which would be useful and were forgotten just as fast as they came out. The other, and far more impactful, was the DS game Stardust Accelerator, which brought the first pieces of a new archetype known as Infernity, which all gained effects based on having no cards in hand, with this batch including Archfiend, Dwarf, and Guardian. Of these three, Archfiend was the only notable one, able to special summon itself if drawn into a hand with no other cards, and searched an Infernity card when special summoned with no cards in hand, which would become an integral piece of the strategy when the remainder of its cards eventually arrived. With these, we'd round out the month of May with no new tournament results, with the community really starting to feel the effects of the lack of competitive events, although some were just around the corner. Starter Deck 2009 Release Date June 6, 2009 Set Type Starter Deck Major Strategies X Saber Impact the cat is back. This year's starter decks had an interesting impact on the game as a whole that we really haven't seen out of a non-first of the era starter deck either before or since. And it entirely comes down to the inclusion of a single card, Xaber Airbellum. So for most who were looking at this year, Airbellum, alongside its siblings and the Xaber archetype, were not due out for us until November with Hidden Arsenal which would reprint the first set of dual terminal cards, even though the cards had not yet been released stateside, even in the dual terminal cabinets. Airbellum, Urbellum, and Gotham's Emergency Call were all printed here first, however, making them legal to use prior to the rest of the archetype, and honestly speaking, Airbellum was probably the best of them to release anyways because it was a level 3 beast tuner, making it summonable with Rescue Cat. In addition to this, it also hand-ripped a card from the opponent when it dealt battle damage, meaning summoning two with Cat in some situations could result in a massive hand rip. This would be clearly seen with the European Championships a couple weeks later on June 27th, where a new deck found its way into the top cut in Cat Control, even taking the event piloted by Victorio Wichter, which aimed to use the various Cat targets like Air Bellum, Dark Panther, and Raiko to make synchro plays and generally control the game state alongside heavier control options like Cyber Valley. This would also, unfortunately, be the only Nationals level event with full coverage from this period, as many of the other standard National Scales events at the time are difficult to find full coverage for outside of the odd Top 16 deck list. With that said, there were a couple more releases between Euros and the World Championship, but with their content lineups, it was safe to assume nothing was going to change by then. Duelist Pack Yugi. Release date, July 7th, 2009. Set type, Duelist Pack. Major strategies, random cards Yugi played. Impact, reprinting a couple of cards. Duelist Pack Yugi was the first Duelist Pack ever to bring absolutely no new cards along with its release, purely being a collection of cards used by Yugi in the anime, which did allow the set to reprint a couple of cards that had only one or two printings prior to this, but nothing major beyond that. Notable reprints here included Marshmallow, The Gadgets, Brain Control, Exchange, Mirror Force, and Monster Reborn. This would be the entire legacy of this set, leading into the last pack before Worlds three weeks later. Retro Pack 2. Release date, July 28, 2009. Set type, Reprint Set. Major Strategies, the impactful promos of the last year. Impact, providing the EU with powerful promos. Retropack 2, similar to the first, was originally going to be an EU exclusive set, but was also released worldwide roughly a week later. But the primary impact this had was giving the EU player base access to a variety of cards that were only available as promos in the US that were otherwise illegal to play in the EU. Reprints here included Gores, Light and Darkness Dragon, and Green Baboon, alongside the first ever printing of Dragon Master Knight in the TCG, although this card was not impactful in the slightest. The 2009 World Championships would take place just over a week later on August 9th, and with it we'd see a powerful performance out of Gladiator Beast specifically, seeing Pure take 4 of the top 8 with an additional Cat variant to boot. However, 
Gladiator Beast would not win the day, as the event was taken by Benjamin Tai Hung Hui of Singapore playing Black Wings, playing Icarus Attack at its full three copies to take advantage of the swarming potential provided by the Black Wing effects. With this event in the books, Konami's takeover of the TCG was officially complete, which was marked by two specific events. The first of these was the first ever Turbo Pack, which took the place of the Champion Packs, given to official tournament stores to use as prizing for locals, and aimed at providing reprints to cards that were competitively viable and harder to get, with the first one reprinting Doom Caliber Knight, the previous SJC prize card, and Crush Card Virus, being its first printing since the Gold Series short prints. The second was the first SJC since April, being SJC Indianapolis, taking place on the same day on August 15th, and we'd see just how much the meta had changed since the previous SJC. Most of the faces here were identical to their showings in the previous European Championship with one major exception, being the rise in Salvo Dad lists. Taking inspiration from the Salvo and Dekoichi inclusion in previous Blackwing lists, Salvo Dad aimed to mix the power of Dad decks with the explosive finish that was normal summon Salvo for Dark Strike Fighter, able to burn for severe amounts of damage thanks to the higher level darks you could play with. Philly Luna would take the event with Blackwings, marking his fourth SJC title, which would also mark his place in history as the player to win the most SJCs in the entirety of the game's history, as the tournament series would be discontinued in 2010 to make way for the YCS structure we know today. The final event of August this year was the release of the Collectible 10's 2009 Wave 1, which brought Power Tool Dragon and the upcoming Ancient Fairy Dragon as promos, which leads us to... Ancient Prophecy. Release date, September 1st, 2009. Set type, Core Set. Major Strategies, Blackwing, Fortune Lady, x Saber. Impact, laying the groundwork for future success. Ancient Prophecy was the third core set of the year, and while the meta wouldn't change rapidly from its releases like how the last couple of sets did, it would spawn a couple of new decks into the space thanks to a couple of specific cards. The first of these cards was Vayu the Emblem of Honor, which was the only Blackwing of note from this release, unable to be used for Synchro Summons normally, but was instead able to banish itself and one other Blackwing from Grave to cheat out a Blackwing Synchro with its effects negated. This would occasionally be splashed into Blackwings as a comeback option, but for the most part would be played in its own new deck known as Vayu Turbo, which took many cues from the previous dad lists loading up the grave with copies of Vayu and Sirocco using cards like Armageddon Knight and Dark Refer to use Vayu's effect, able to summon out Armed Wing and eventually Armor Master by using Vayu with dead Armed Wings. The Fortune Ladies made their debut here too, a series of spellcasters whose attack is equal to their level times a multiplier and gained a level every turn, with Light being worth noting as she special summoned a Fortune Lady from deck if removed from the field by card effect. While this wouldn't be particularly good now, as the only target to summon with her effect was Fire, who popped a monster on special summon and burned the opponent, which wasn't the greatest payoff for the investment, the strategy would get better with time. Kawaki Meru saw a couple of new additions here with Boulder, who searched a Kawaki Meru monster or core on battle destruction, and Crusader, who searched a Kawaki Meru when it destroyed a monster in battle. Fishborg Blaster was a level 1 fish tuner, able to special summon itself from Grave by discarding a card while you control a level 3 or lower water monster. While not too great now, Fishborg Blaster would become a major piece of an FTK later in the era that would earn its current position on the ban list. x Saber received a couple of boosting support pieces here as a part of the XX Saber line in Faltrol, who could special summon himself if you control two x Saber monsters and could special summon an x Saber from Grave once per turn. Gotham's, a level 9 synchro that could tribute an x Saber to rep a card from the opponent's hand, and the TCG exclusive Full Helm Knight, a level 3 tuner who can negate an attack targeting an x Saber once while on field and revives an x Saber from Grave that destroys a defense position monster in battle. x Sabers would see serious experimentation from here thanks to the already popular performance of Air Bellum with Rescue Cat but wouldn't break into the meta contention quite yet with this support. Flamvel Fire Dog would be the first of the upcoming Flamvel archetype, able to summon a fire monster with 200 defense from deck when it destroys something in battle, which was set up for the archetype's key spell Rekindling, which revives as many 200 defense fire monsters as possible. Fire Dog was recognizably good, but simply lacked a good target to summon at this time, but it would get one soon enough. Ancient Fairy Dragon was the cover card of the set and held a few utility effects, 
able to pop the active field spell to gain a thousand life points and search a new one, and could special summon a level 4 or lower monster from hand once per turn. At the time, this was considered one of the worst of the five signer dragons that 5Ds is named after, but would eventually, with changes in game design, become the absolute best. Ancient Sacred Wyvern was a new boss for light strategies, being a level 7 synchro that gained or lost attack equal to the difference between yours and your opponent's life points, able to push a lead much further if you were ahead, or being downright useless if you were behind, being one of the most win more cards ever. Solidarity was a new tool for beatdown decks specializing in a single type of monster, boosting the board by 800 attack if all monsters in grave were the same type, seeing some experimentation. Fossil Dig was effectively Rota for dinosaurs, which wasn't good now but would see play any time dinosaurs became meta-relevant. Lastly, Elemental Hero Gaia was an OCG import that could be splashed into hero beat decks to summon using Miracle Fusion able to cut an opponent's attack in half and add that amount to Gaia's own attack until the end of the turn. Accompanying this pack, a new ban list was released the same day on September 1st, marking the end of cat format by hitting many of the pivotal pieces remaining in the meta. Newly banned were Dark Strike Fighter, being the first ban list since its release and shockingly being gone that fast, Card of Safe Return, which had overstayed its welcome at this point, Monster Reborn, as it was sort of collateral for a release later in the list, and Crush Card Virus, as the card had terrorized the format for far too long at this point. Newly limited were Black Rose Dragon, Blackwing Gale the Whirlwind, Demise, Mindmaster, Rescue Cat, Summoner Monk, Cold Wave, Mind Control, One for One, Call the Haunted, and Solemn Judgment. Newly semied were Chaos Sorcerer, Lone Fire Blossom, Mizuki, and Bottomless. Lastly, unlimited were Breaker the Magical Warrior, Didi Warrior Lady, Green Baboon, Ryza, Destiny Draw, and Fissure. In addition to this, Shonen Jump would release a new promo card for the month of September, being Tragodia, a monster that can special summon itself when you take battle damage, similarly to Gores. Gaining attack and defense for each card in your hand, can discard a monster once per turn to steal an opponent's monster of the same level, and can change its own level to match any monster in your graves once per turn. Tragodia was instantly experimented with thanks to being a pseudo gores that you didn't have to have an empty board to summon, seeing play on and off throughout the era. SJC Orlando would be the first testing grounds for the new meta landscape on September 26th, and with it we'd see a new trend of the format. Light Sworn was the new top deck in town, as both Pure and Twilight variants would take the majority of top cut spots for this period of the game's history. Zombie Teledad was the newest pivot the deck took, combining the shell of what zombies were after the recent ban list with the dad core to form a fairly powerful deck that could take games shockingly fast with the right setup. Bayou Turbo would see its first top here, seeing mostly a chaos dad core behind it, but also playing both Dimensional Alchemist and Burial from the Different Dimension to cycle used Bayous back into rotation, making it all the way up to second place at this event. First place would be claimed by Rodrigo Tagores on Black Wings, also choosing to tech in both Vayu as well as Dark Greffer to access the same Vayu Turbo line when needed. As sort of a more minor point, Ancient Prophecy Special Edition released on October 8th following this SJC. While up until now I've made little mention of the Special Edition sets, as they've been effectively the same pack as before with reprinted promos included, this time was slightly different, as the card being reprinted was Red Eyes Wyvern, which meant that now it was legally able to be played in US tournaments thanks to having a US legal printing. SJC Austin would follow this on October 17th, and we'd see similar results with Light Sworn and Twilight filling out the top ranks, although we'd also see a phase we haven't seen in some time reappear. Chaos Control reappeared with two of the top 16 spots here, mostly thanks to the semi-limiting of Chaos Sorcerer making it possible to mix the previous dad core with some other light-focused staples like Dimensional Alchemist and Raiko to bolster the deck's strength. Chris Bowling would take first place here with Twilight, being his second major event title after the US Nationals the previous year, similarly taking advantage of the newly semi Chaos Sorcerer to completely drop Dark Arm Dragon from the list. With Austin in the books, that leaves just three more set releases and one more SJC for 2009 and the next structure deck was sure to change something, just not in its own time. Warrior Strike. Release date, October 27th, 2009. Set type, structure deck. Major strategies, Gemini. Impact, useless in its time, sleeper in retrospect. The Warrior Strike structure deck is really an odd topic knowing what we know now about it. 
In its time, it was considered to be one of the worst structure decks of its era, bringing support to the Gemini subtype with Evocator Chevalier, Featherizer, Gemini Soldier, Hidden Armory, Phoenix Gearfreed, and Supervise. While not appreciated in its time, retro format lookbacks in the past year have actually discovered this structure deck may have been far more powerful than initially expected, mostly thanks to the interaction between Gemini Soldier and the trap Reinforced Truth from Ancient Prophecy able to quickly establish it with its effect to control the game state. Unfortunately, hindsight is 2020, so this will most likely be the last time we're talking about this deck for a really long time due to the stigma that Gemini is a bad mechanic. Which it is, it just wasn't as bad as people thought. Reprints in this time included Exiled Force, DD Warrior Lady, Cart Trooper, Mind Control, Burden of the Mighty, MST, Rhoda, and Dark Bribe, with some of these being the first easy access reprint they've received ever. The structure may have been forgotten in its time, but the set that directly followed by far would not be, as while many of its strategies fell flat, some of the staple synchros it brought would completely rule the game for years to come. Hidden Arsenal Release date, November 10th, 2009 Set type, deck building set Major strategies, dual terminal wave 1 Impact, Revitalization of the Extra Deck Hidden Arsenal was the official pack release and legalization of the previously announced Dual Terminal exclusive cards. For those who are unfamiliar, Dual Terminal was an arcade-style cabinet that was originally debuted at Comic-Con in August of 2008, which aimed to do a fast-paced style arcade version of Yu-Gi-Oh!, rewarding a random card from its card pool to players for each playthrough. However, the cabinets were also slowly receiving their own unique storyline, known as the Dual Terminal series, which would occasionally debut cards early in the cabinets that would become legal upon their wide release later with the Hidden Arsenal packs. At this time, the first wave of Dual Terminal was a bit behind Hidden Arsenal's release, not being officially released until early 2010, so while the legality of cards wasn't an issue now, outside of a single card that it printed in a previous wave, it would become a more major point as we moved into 2010. In the meantime, Hidden Arsenal would bring with it six new archetypes to the game. However, these were archetypes we had actually already seen on and off at this point through their inclusion in other sets. Each of these archetypes spanned one of the six attributes and for the most part focused on their synchro boss monsters with a single exception. The first of these was Ice Barrier, water monsters primarily aimed at stunning out opponents to make their boss Bryonic Dragon of the Ice Barrier, a level 6 synchro that could discard cards to bounce that many cards from field to hand any number of times in a turn. This was the first of many synchros in the set to actually have powerful effects on a generic body, and there was no requirements to summon Bryonic or almost any of the synchro bosses here, meaning that practically all of them would see some form of extra deck staple play moving forward from here, with Bryonic being arguably tied for the most useful. The second archetype was Mist Valley, a series of wind monsters focused around bouncing cards to hand for swarming and effect usage. Their boss, Mist Worm, was a level 9 synchro requiring 3 materials that bounced up to 3 cards from field to hand on summon. While not quite as stable as Bryonic, Mistworm would see significant play as one of the biggest useful synchros you could make to swing a game in your favor. Next up were Flamvels, a series of fire monsters with 200 defense that we've actually already seen before with their cards Fire Dog and Rekindling in the previous core set. Their synchro, Iruquazaz, was a level 6 that dealt piercing, which wasn't quite as useful as its contemporaries, but more importantly, the set brought Flamvel Magician. While its effect meant literally nothing to an average player, as it's purely there for the lore of the dual terminal cards, what was important was that it was a level 4 fire tuner with 200 defense, meaning you could summon it with Fire Dog's effect to access a level 8 synchro in main phase 2, and make rekindling a free synchro summon later in the duel. This fact alone would have Magician see play for a period of time after this purely as one of the most reliable ways into Stardust Dragon. Following Flamvels were X-Sabers, with their monsters Air Bellum and Er Bellum. Yeah, we've already seen these. X-Saber kind of blew its load early by releasing its best cards in the year's starter deck, so unfortunately they received no new useful tools here. Following that disappointment was Ally of Justice, a series of dark machines that gained specific benefits when dealing with light monsters which was so niche in its application that it was completely useless outside of one card of theirs that didn't have such a niche use. 
Ally of Justice Cataster was their synchro boss, a level 5 that destroyed any non-dark it battled, instantly becoming the end-all level 5 synchro target in the game and being tied with Bryonic for the best card of the set. Lastly were the Worms, who didn't have a synchro boss and were a set of lackluster light reptiles that were either flip monsters or supported flip monsters, seeing no relevant play on release. SJC Columbus would take place less than a week later on November 14th, and a couple of changes were noticeable immediately. For starters, the hidden arsenal synchros had made their way into the meta without issue, seeing Cataster, Bryonic, or Mistworm show up in almost every extra deck in some capacity. Secondly, Zombie Teledad had a seriously powerful performance here, revitalizing the deck with cards like Diamond Dude to fuel card draw and Caius to form dark pushes with its banish effect. Diva Zombie would be a new face on the block here, able to use Diva to summon two level 2 tuners to the board to mix with your zombies to make quick and easy synchro pushes and climbs. Now able to make Bryonic with a Diva and a Zombie to bounce the board, then use Bryonic and a Diva to climb into a level 8 like Stardust or Red Dragon Archfiend. Vincent Rolambomi Adana would win the day with Twilight, opting for both Chaos Sorcerer and Dad Roots, but also notably playing 3 Tragodia to bolster his Dark Count, showing the power of this battle hand trap. This would be the last SJC of the year, as with the last core set of the year around the corner, the year would be coming to a close as the shiftings from the corporate side of the game slowed the development of the metagame around it. Stardust Overdrive Release date, November 17th, 2009 Set type, Core Set Major Strategies, Synchron, Fortune Lady, Reptilian Impact, nothing in the short term, a lot of one-offs for the long game. Stardust Overdrive was the final core set of 2009, and while it brought nothing to change the immediate future of the metagame, it brought so many one-off cards that would shape the near future of the game that it's hard to overlook. Quickdraw Synchron was a new tuner to add to the Synchron pool, able to consider itself any Synchron tuner for the summoning of a Synchro requiring one, but couldn't be used for any other Synchros. While at this point the Synchron Synchros weren't all that impressive, Quickdraw would grow more useful as more and more powerful Synchron Synchros emerged in the coming months. Level Eater was a level 1 that could summon itself from Grave by reducing the level of a 5 or higher monster by 1, which wasn't too useful now, seeing some play in Monarch strategies as a niche option, but would similarly grow stronger with time. Infernity Necromancer was another tool in the theoretical Infernity deck alongside the previously released promo Archfiend able to revive an Infernity from Grave once per turn if you had no cards in hand, but was still missing that X factor to make the strategy sing. Fortune Lady received a couple of good targets to summon with Light's effect in Water, who drew two cards on Special Summon, and Dark, who provided Grave Recursion, but neither would be good enough to make Fortune Lady viable outside of niche OTK strategies. Reptilian was a series of reptiles focused on dropping attack values to zero, but was so incredibly unfocused that it flopped hard on release. Swap Frog was the next in the line of theoretically good frog support, able to special summon itself by discarding a water, able to dump a water aqua from deck to grave on summon, and able to bounce a monster from field to hand once per turn to give you an additional frog normal summon. This one would be the frog to break them out of being purely theoretical, however, as Swap Frog provided both consistent board presence and grave setup to pair the frogs with monarchs, giving them the tribute fodder they needed to be good, spawning the deck of frog monarch from this combination. The Jin monsters would also release here, a series of fiends that could be banished from Grave to pay the cost of a Ritual Summon, giving that Ritual Summoned monster effects if used this way. Of these, the most notable one was Jin, Releaser of Rituals, who locked the opponent's special summons as long as her Ritual monster was on the field, which while inconsistent now would cause a severe headache in a few years. Blackwings received a new Synchro in Silverwind the Ascendant, who was a level 8 requiring 3 materials, killing its usefulness almost immediately, but it would see play simply as a level 8 target to summon with Vayu in Vayu Turbo decks. Gemini Spark was another piece of Gemini support, able to tribute off a Gemini to pop a card on field and draw a card. While this was intended to give Gemini decks more of a footing, what it actually did was give Hero Beat another push into the meta by creating a resource loop with Neos Alias allowing you to tribute a Neos Alias to pop a card and draw, then use Hero Blast to add the tributed Alias back to hand and pop an additional monster, turning Hero Beat into a serious meta contender. 
Preparation of Rites allowed you to search for a level 7 or lower ritual monster and recur a ritual spell from grave to hand, seemingly built specifically to exclude Demise from this search to prevent another Demise OTK list. Because of this, Preparation of Rites would see no play in this short term period, but would become useful as a searcher for any future ritual strategies if the mechanic ever became useful. Stygian Dirge was an odd floodgate, dropping the level of all opponent's monsters by one, which was intended to block synchro spamming but was just mostly an inconvenience. It would, however, see play in later eras to block out other kinds of extra deck mechanics that were more rigid on their level requirements. A Pointer of the Red Lotus was a trap that could temporarily banish a card from the opponent's hand, which while not too useful now, as most decks were operating as a pseudo toolbox of options, it would be useful as more and more decks move towards a more combo-oriented playstyle. Gateway of the Six was a TCG exclusive that gained two Bushido counters anytime you summoned a six samurai monster, then could remove counters from your side of the field to trigger an effect, with two getting you an attack boost, four getting you a search for a six samurai, and six letting you revive a sheen monster from the grave. While it wouldn't be too good now, as six samurai only really had one spam out option in Grandmaster, who could only have one copy on the field at a time, if six samurai ever got the ability to spam summon, this could become an issue really fast thanks to the lack of once per turns on it. Lastly, we have a few OCG import boss monsters that all have their own unique special summoning conditions being Dark Samorg, who could be special summoned from hand by banishing a Dark and Wind in Grave, or from Grave by banishing a Dark and Wind in hand, and prevented the opponent from setting cards. Arclord Christia, who could be special summoned if you had four fairies in Grave, adding one from Grave to hand on summon, lock special summoning for both players while on field, and place itself on top of the deck when sent to Grave, and Guardian Iados, who could special summon herself if you had no monsters in Grave, and could send an equip spell on her to Grave to banish up to three monsters from the opponent's Grave, gaining 500 attack for each. Of these, Christia and Iados would find some niche play, with Christia finding the occasional tech spot in some Lightsworn builds, and Iados finding a niche in Macro Drain decks as a free 2500 body since your Grave usually had no monsters in it. And with that, 2009 came to a close. All in all, the year itself was fairly uneventful on the surface due to the legal battle waging in the background, but this was simply the calm before the storm. As we entered into 2010, we'd find a wonderland of new playable strategies, a wasteland of new menaces, and the birth of the long-running mainstay of the competitive community. A huge shout out to my Dark Law level patrons, Jukes, Otaku GamerX, Prinrin, and Ryza339, as well as all of my other patrons over on Patreon.com. If you want to help support the channel and see my videos a day early, consider supporting me on Patreon, where support tiers start at just $1 a month. If you enjoyed what you saw here today, consider subscribing to the channel. We're actually getting really close to 20,000 subscribers, so any little bit helps. So be sure to pound that subscribe button. Thank you all again, and I'll see you next time.